I'd like to introduce to you a, a lovely young lady, Ms. Leslie Meggs. Leslie has flown in from Texas to be with us here tonight and is supported by her mother, um, Wendy, in the audience. Um, we want you to hear Leslie's story of how meningitis has changed her life in so many ways. Leslie? Good evening. Um, my name is Leslie Meggs. And um, I'm 21 years old, and I just wanted to share with you guys uh, my story with bacterial meningitis and how it has changed my life and how it will continue to change my life for as long as I'm here. I was eight years old uh, when I was diagnosed with meningitis, and the strange thing about it is I had always been a healthy kid. I had never been sick before in my entire life, other than a minor cold once or twice. And so when I woke up one morning uh, not feeling too well, it was really out of character for me. And so my mom took me to the doctor to see what was going on. And um, I was one of those kids. Um, I, I tried to push back any types of pain or any types of um, dis distress because I always wanted to play and enjoy myself. So I got to the doctor's office and I was swinging my legs on the table and enjoying myself and being polite and saying hello. So of course he didn't see anything wrong with me and uh, he sent me home. But as the day progressed, uh, so did my symptoms. And by the end of the day, my mom was calling the doctor every hour because I had thrown up um, I was throwing up every hour. My fever had reached uh, 106 degrees was the highest it reached that night. And there was a point where um, I was laying on the bed and I turned to my mom and I said, Mom, look at, look at the dresser. Do you see on your dresser? And she said, do I see what? And I said, the angels that are on your dresser. Do you see the two angels on your dresser? And it was at that point that uh, we knew that something just wasn't, wasn't right. And so um, she laid me aside from the bed because she had to change out the sheets because I threw up again. And I was laying on my stomach. And she noticed these weird purple spots all over the back of my legs. And she said, Leslie, what happened to you? And being eight years old, I was like, oh, I probably fell at recess. It's probably just a bruise. Not a big deal. And she just kind of said, oh, OK. And then she looked at the back of my arms, and she saw them starting to appear on my arms. And she turned me over, and she saw them all over my stomach, all over my hands, and all over my face. And that's when she called the ER. And uh, she, she told the nurse uh, how bad everything was getting, that my temperature was still getting worse. And the nurse said the same thing, just let her rest, give her Tylenol, she'll be fine, put her in an ice bath. And my mom said, look, something is not right. Um, she's still feeling sick, it's getting worse, and now there's this weird purple rash that's covering her body, and it's all irregular shaped, and, and, and it's growing. And uh, at that point, the nurse completely freaked out. She said, oh my God, oh my God, you need to bring her in right away. She's dying, she's critical. When I got to the ER, oh, they kept me in the waiting room um, while they got everything checked out because it was very full in there. And I remember they gave me this little vomit cup because um, I was still very nauseous and still throwing up uh, cons very consistently. And when people would walk past me, I mean, they would look at me and they would keep as, as big of a distance as they could because I looked like I popped out of a sci-fi movie. I had all these purple spots all over my face. And um, finally they brought me back and they did the normal temperature, weight, blood pressure thing. And then they did a spinal tap. And um, when my spinal fluid came back completely clear, um, they decided that they immediately needed to call a life flight helicopter to come and pick me up um, because the ambulance would have taken way too long and I wouldn't have made it. When we landed on top of Texas Children's Hospital, um, they immediately wheeled me into the ICU. And the last thing I remember is laying in the bed. They wouldn't let my parents come with me. And them shoving needles in my arms and legs and tubes down my nose and throat. And I just remember lying there and crying and praying that the pain would go away and asking for my mom, asking for my dad. I ended up spending two whole months at Texas Children's Hospital. I was in a coma for three weeks, and I was on a ventilator for three weeks. 
Um, there was one point where I had to learn how to walk all over again because I had been bedridden for so long. But even though the meningitis didn't take my arms and my legs, it took my kidneys, it took my motor function, and um, it took, it, it gave me scars covering my body. And so two months later, when I was discharged from the hospital, um, it wasn't a disease that just went away just because it was treated. I was on dialysis for a very long time afterwards um, because my kidney function had completely shut down. I had to go to physical therapy for a very long time, which was absolutely excruciating as an eight-year-old. So somehow, uh, my kidney function improved to the point where I could get the dialysis catheter taken out and um, I could function without needing a transplant or anything. And so I went about 12 years of my life living a completely healthy life. I took basic medications uh, to make sure my kidney function didn't decline anymore. And I thought that it was all over. My junior year of high school, um, I went to this one appointment with my nephrologist. And he sat my family down and he said, I know it's been 12 years. This is a natural thing, but we're going to need to perform a kidney transplant. Her kidney function is declining. It's not getting better no matter what we do. She's going to need a transplant. And at the time, um, I was very involved in high school. I did all types of student government and debate. And I, I just looked at him and I said, I really don't have time for a transplant. I mean, I'm way too busy for this. And he kind of was like, uh, OK. And so uh, we ended up going home. And um, my parents and I, we found this alternative to a transplant, something that could kind of prolong the kidney function um, or slow down the decline of kidney function. And it was this low protein vegan diet where you took um, amino acid supplements three times a day. So I thought, you know, why not? And so for the next two years, instead of getting a transplant, I had max 10 grams of protein a day and took um, probably close to 30 pills a day so that I wouldn't become malnourished and that I could keep my kidney function going as much as I could. And so going to the movies with friends, no popcorn, no ices, because then I also had to watch out for the normal potassium and sodium levels. And so I really didn't have much to eat at all. And um, that was a very big lesson in self-control, but it, it took away my normal high school life because of a disease that's prevented by a vaccine. So when I started college, um, my freshman year, uh, I decided that I wanted to study biochemistry and eventually get into medicine. And so my uh, course load was and still is very heavy. And I couldn't keep up with my diet as well. And so um, my kidney function started declining again. And uh, my nephrologist said, this was a great diet while it lasted. Look how well it worked. But we really don't have any other option now. We're going to need to do a kidney transplant. And so um, the first two people they tested were my parents. And both of them, luckily, were a match. Uh, my dad was a little bit better of a match than my mom. <laughs> uh, so they started prepping him for the transplant. So that first entire semester of college, my kidney function just kept declining, declining, and declining as they were preparing me for the transplant. And I lived in the dorms, so I was away from home as well. And there were points where I would get out of bed in the morning, and I would hop onto the floor, and my feet were so swollen because of the kidney failure that they would jiggle. Um, I was throwing up on a daily basis. The taste of metallic, that, that effect of, of kidney failure, you could smell it off of my mouth. And uh, for some reason, I still stayed in classes. And I found a way to adapt to it. But it, it was hard. I couldn't go out. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And I had this diet to stay on top of. But I had a transplant to look forward to. So the second semester of my freshman year, my dad donated his kidney to me. And um, I thought, now everything's going to go back to normal. Everything is going to be healthy again. I'm not going to have a worry in the world.